how much money did you start with? Honestly, it may have been zero dollars back in 2013, 2014. I may have just gotten free books from school. And what was the very first product that you sold? That was a book about birthdays. That's one fun thing about starting with books. Kind of harder to find them, but the ROI is unreal. What kind of ROIs are you looking for when you're trying to find a product to source? Right now, my sweet spot is I'm trying to average 40% ROI. So I set that as my minimum, knowing I'm gonna go below it quite often, but that I'll have some good ones that are higher. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have the pleasure to talk to the host of Insider Growth Group, Rachel and Cody. Both of them started their Amazon business when they were still in school and now they have joined forces with Amazon experts to help their community to help you unravel and get more from your Q4. So let's welcome Rachel and Cody to our show today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So we'll start with you, Rachel. To help our audience know a little bit more about you, why did you start your Amazon business? So I technically started my Amazon business in 2011, and that was honestly just to help me offload some textbooks from college. And that's kind of how it continued for me until 2019. And at that point, I had actually been a teacher for eight years, and I loved teaching, but it was a little hard to make all the ends meet. So I wanted to get some extra cash for bills and things like that. So I started selling used books from places like Goodwill, St. Vincent de Paul, things like that. And I did that for a couple of months. And then at the same time, I actually removed myself from the teaching world and went back to graduate school too. And then I, I just, I kept doing both of those things, going to grad school and selling on Amazon. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work too, to try to be, you know, full-time in kind of both of those worlds. The books were fun, but I eventually learned, um, actually through Hustle Buddies um, with Nate Jackson, I learned about selling from different stores and that I didn't have to do used books. I could sell things like clothing from Kohl's. I could sell clearance toys. And that's kind of where my journey began was kind of that exiting education and then trying to see if I could become full-time with it or if I was going to need to use the master's degree that I was also working towards. So that's kind of how I got into all this. That's like buying some insurance. Yeah. Yes. Or uh, the schooling <laughs> part too, right? Yeah. What yeah. about you, Cody? Why don't you share with us? Sure. Well, I think I found Amazon initially in 2013 or 2014, a similar setup. I was in school. I actually ran a moving company at the time. So my initial thought process was, hey, moving is slow in the winter, but reselling on Amazon is very busy. So I'd kind of do focus on one moving in the summer and then Amazon stuff in the winter. I too started out with books, same strategy Rachel's describing, go into like thrift stores and things like that. And I enjoyed the hunt at that time. However, for me, kind of my transition point was, I think I found like FBA Masters or some other Facebook group and then just got plugged into, oh, you can go to the clearance aisle. People will buy stuff from Walmart and Target. People will pay more than what full price is at the store on Amazon because they just can't get the product where they're at. And that really kind of blew my mind and opened the door. And then for you know myself, we really started to take selling on Amazon seriously in about 2016. And then I'd say probably early 2018 or so, you know, we went full, full time where it was our sole income. I sold the moving company and, you know, we've been doing just Amazon ever since. And, you know, we're in a 6,000 square foot warehouse facility here in Minnesota. We have a contract manufacturing, co-packing, you know, arm of our business. You know, we make food, private label stuff. We do OARA wholesale, all that good stuff. The Amazon opportunity is still alive and well, even though it takes way more work than it did, say, a decade ago. And how did you meet Rachel? So we actually met through Nate Jackson and Hustle Buddies. We had this kind of grand vision of being able to start a group that would go ahead and support larger sellers who, you know, want basically support and strategy from other people on what they're doing and how they're growing, but also want to reduce a lot of the kind of the clutter and the, the run of the mill questions that's, you know, they kind of surpassed and already know the answers to. So we went ahead and kind of got started with that. And we ran it last year and then we kept it going from basically, I think, July last year up to now. 
And Rachel, is that your understanding? Is that how you guys met? <laughs> yes, as far as I can recall, that is how we met. You know, I just want to take this opportunity to kind of, I try to do this now. When we talk to groups of people, I need to plug Cody. He is an awesome partner. I'm like the hyper organized one and he has three years more experience than me. And it's, it feels sometimes like he has like 20 years more experience than me. He, he knows his stuff. So I, I love working with him. Do you have to pay Cody for his mentoring? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm also the more touchy feely one. So I always throw stuff like that out. <laughs> okay. But in all seriousness, like when did you decide to go full time and leave that teaching career? So for me, and this is no dig at like any particular school, but it's when I started getting placed more and more in middle school. <laughs> I found my energy a lot more with upper level high school. And then uh, after I was with middle school for a few years, even the thought of going back to high school and continuing just kind of tore at my soul. <laughs> I was burnt out. So it was that fall of 2019, though. And I, I am grateful for the timing of my burnout, considering how the next couple of years went. I can't imagine what the educators went through the last couple of years and continue to now, considering the teacher shortages and, you know, all the other difficulties that are coming with everything. So the timing was pretty cool for me personally. And what about for you, Cody? When did you make that decision to go full-time? Like I said, I think it was either mid to late 2017 or in the start of 2018. And But I guess I'll kind of phrase the overall answer in a way that I think will help the audience decide for themselves as well. I really think it's time for you to start going you know, full-time or majorly cutting back on your hours and trying to go part-time at whatever your normal job is when the amount of money you can make when you're putting in the work to your business exceeds the amount of money that you're making by giving your time to whatever your job is. That totally makes sense. And talking about money, Cody, how much money did you start with? Oh, jeez. Honestly, it may have been $0 back in you know, 2013, 2014. I may have just gotten free books from school, or I guess technically I paid for them that semester. Um, so I just had them left over. Nowadays, though, for somebody, depending on what you're doing, you can definitely still smart start with an extremely small amount of money. Uh, however, it definitely is much easier to scale, especially as tools like, you know, repricing software as inventory management systems become more and more imperative to success to have a, a small bankroll. I'd say, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars. But that shouldn't stop you from starting with ex extremely small amounts because you totally can your journey is just going to be vastly a lot more work at the beginning than somebody that has a bankroll. And that's not bad because your story is your own. And that's awesome. And Rachel, how much money did you start with? I think for the most part, my answer is really, really similar to Cody's um, since it was the whole used book world, you know, and you can get books for a dollar to three dollars. And at first it was really just my own money out of my pocket. I didn't have a set amount of money I was working with. When I started to, I don't really want to say scale up because this wasn't the level of scaling up, but when I started to go um, and do more RA rather than just books, that is about the time that I opened up a credit card. I hadn't had a credit card in years for own, my own personal reasons. A lot of Applebee's in my 20s. So um, I was no longer allowed to have a credit card. Um, but I opened it back up for this purpose with just a limit of like five grand. And that was more than enough to get me comfortably started. And I would almost caution against starting with anything more than that. If you're brand new, you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> and it's really good to have a cap for the cost of your mistakes. So I, I think five grand was a good mark, but it would be easy to do with 500 or anything in that range. And what was the very first product that you sold? So I actually went back and looked a little while ago because I was curious and it was an American history textbook that I don't remember ever seeing. <laughs> but yeah, that's what it was. And what did you pay for it? And how much did you sell it for? Ooh, I mean, I bought it for whatever the college made me pay for it. So unfortunately, probably way too much. So I did definitely, I definitely did not make money on that. The first thing I would have made money on probably would have been when I started purposefully doing this in 2019. And that was a book about birthdays. That's all I remember, but I would have bought it for like a buck 50 at Goodwill or something like that. And I think it sold for like $35. That's one fun thing about starting with books is 
you know, it's kind of harder to find them. It takes more manual labor and work and time, but the ROI is unreal. Yeah. That's why I like starting with books. And it sounds like you don't need a large capital to start with if you purchase for $1.50 at uh, Goodwills. Yeah. So Absolutely. Absolutely. What about you, Cody? What was the first profitable product that you sold? I tried to go back and look, but I was unsuccessful. Um, <laughs> I guarantee it was a book of some sort. You know, it could have been like New Testament history and literature or something about the gospel of Thomas. Who knows? But what I will share is kind of one of the things I vividly remember being kind of my first like, aha, I think I, I have an epiphany with how this works. Is I was at Big Lots and myself and uh, the gentleman that owned the moving company with me were there. We were doing some, you know, RA at Big Lots with our 20% off coupon. And we ran across some, I think it was called like L'Oreal Age Defy Cream. It was in this black tube with purple coloring on it. And it's been long, long dis been discontinued. And it was probably about two fifty at the store. So with the coupon, you were paying two bucks for a bottle. And I went super deep for what I thought at the time and bought 18 of it. And that it made me like four bucks a purchase off of the $2 buy cost. And we sold, you know, all of those within just a couple of days doing Merchant Fulfill. And I was absolutely blown away that someone would buy this thing that I could make that much money, which really in the grand scheme of things isn't a whole lot of money, but it was just seeing that like these principles that had been driven into me by other people about how important replenishables are, how important it is to just be disciplined and make sure that you like check all the items in a store and that you don't just scan things that you are only interested in, but just check everything that to really cease all those kind of little lessons that I had been taught really pay off was a big kind of aha moment for me. That's incredible. It's like when you're able to sell a product that for you didn't seem like worth a lot, but then, then when somebody else is willing to pay, you know, big bucks for it or almost yep. full price for it. And tell us, what was your learning curve like doing the Amazon business? Oh, well, especially at the beginning, because my time was, you know, divided between my moving company and Amazon. There was a lot going on and it's very hard. So, you know, if anyone is discouraged that they feel that they're not learning and they're watching other people see success, again, you know, your journey is your own and you go at your own pace and, you know, just don't give up and, you know, continue to learn. Especially at the beginning, you know nothing. And so it's extremely hard. I would say most sellers, when you talk to them, probably if you ask them what they think they're like dollar per hour earnings were, like the first couple of months that they worked, you know, seriously and learn stuff, it's probably, you know, nothing. So they probably technically paid zero dollars or were losing some money or maybe made a couple bucks an hour as there's just a whole lot, you know, super new to the space. But if you follow good principles and make sure that, you know, you just stay disciplined, figure out some systems that work for you, you know, it really is fun to watch yourself go from, you know, I earn $2 an hour to now I'm earning $10 an hour to 20 an hour to a hundred an hour, et cetera, et cetera. And what about you, Rachel? Um, I would say my learning curve, you know, it kind of went between these big like spurts of, you know, getting these cool new tools and ideas, different ways of sourcing. And then sometimes it would kind of flatline once in a while. It's been kind of interesting. I think that my biggest times of growth and learning occurred when I was with like within a community. So when I joined Hustle Buddies, that was huge. And actually before that, it was when I joined, there's a, a similar kind of smaller group for booksellers with the guys from that made Scout IQ, that whole group. They were an awesome community for me to kind of start out with. And then I found Hustle Buddies and I had a lot of growth there. And then Chris Grant's OA Challenge and the VIP group. I'm still active in that, um, even though it's been years. I just, I love that community and I learned so much. And then Cody and I have been lucky enough to have a, a different group that's different than those, but kind of complements them, you know, because it's for medium-sized sellers. And I learn a lot in that group too. So I just, I think a lot of your growth and your learning curve is going to be influenced by who you surround yourself with. That's definitely been true for me. So you surround yourself with like-minded individuals so you could see persevere and to push forward. And this is another personal question for you. A lot of sellers, they get like seller's fatigue. When they get started, you know, they might make a whole bunch of money or 
you know, they make a little bit, 50 bucks, 100 bucks there, and they're pretty happy. But then they're kind of run out of products to sell. And then, then they have to do sourcing, and there's a lot of other challenges that they face. How do you people get through the seller fatigue? And one of the ways you mentioned is to surround yourself with a community uh, of like-minded people. Are there other things? Like, do you give yourself a reward now and then? Like, how do you motivate yourself? Um, so before I kind of loop back to your base question, I just want to touch on the reward thing first. Um, one thing I've been doing the last, I don't know, six months or so is I started using the profit first method for my bookkeeping. So what I get to do every three months, and it's coming up in a couple of weeks, I get to pull out a certain amount <laughs> of profit and I am not allowed to spend it on anything other than something awesome. So that's my kind of reward I've set up for myself. And it's just like 1% of my revenue, but it's, it's cool. So what was the original part of the question? Oh, the fatigue. Yes, I think surrounding myself with other people helps immensely, not just because of like the strategies and things like that, the new ideas, but also just knowing I'm not the only person. <laughs> like, I don't think I've had a single struggle that I haven't found multiple other people going through the exact same thing. And even if there isn't a perfect solution to that problem, just knowing you're not alone <laughs> kind of really helps you keep your spirits up until you either find a solution to kind of take that head on or to, you know, find a way around <laughs> the problem and move forward in other directions. So I do think that's a huge, huge thing, but also just being flexible. And yeah, just, just never stop looking for other options. And another thing is if you're getting like exhausted and overworked because you're doing these 10 things and none of them, you know, it's not really panning out how you wanted, pick the three that you're doing best with, forget the other ones and just focus on those and how you can kind of expand whatever's going right with those things and things on average will kind of start looking up. So that's another thing I've been trying to practice myself lately. What about you, Cody? What would you say to somebody who has seller's fatigue? They're exhausted. They have a moving company like you, and then they have other funds going around. They have kids. My goodness. You know, like, what would you recommend them to do? Well, if it's the fall, they should, you know, grab a pumpkin spice latte, as that will help. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of like little rewards. I, yeah, I find, like, I, I do love, in all seriousness, I love pumpkin spice lattes from Dunkin' Donuts. So that is something that I personally do every day. That is a, well, not every day, but it's a small thing for me that brings me some joy. One of the big things that my wife has kind of helped me see this last year is how I'm a workaholic type person. I generally speaking find doing things extremely fulfilling. And so my wife has kind of forced me to take every Sunday off. So where I don't do anything on Sunday, unless it's like the fourth quarter of the year. And I know we have something like specific to do. We don't work on Sundays. We just kind of relax. And that little bit of just kind of doing nothing has been really, really crucial for me this last year to, you know, avoid burnout because there's just been a whole lot going on. Other than that, it's really like Rachel, you know, hit on a bunch of them, like having a really good kind of community of friends, just people to even just kind of like vent to about this is frustrating and for them to just echo their sentiments to just encourage you to kind of keep pushing. I mean, that's kind of what makes like, you know, little Facebook groups and forum communities and things like, you know, Hustle Buddies and whatever and our insiders growth group. That's what makes some of those things super valuable is just the community that you can get out of it and how it can really help encourage you when you're feeling down and how then you can return the favor of when you're on the mountain and help kind of encourage other people and guide them, you know, to keep pushing. Um, I'm just wondering, on Sundays, your off day, you don't check the Amazon seller store app <laughs> at all? Okay, okay, really? I do do that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> see? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just playing, but and then here's a serious question. So many people are a bit scared to start their Amazon business what would you say to somebody in that situation? And what would your suggestion be for them? It's super valid and very normal to be afraid. Business is hard in general. Like starting a business from nothing is very hard. So your your fears are like totally valid. What you gotta understand is that most likely what you're sacrificing is just some, you know, just some money and some time. And yeah, like a few hundred bucks might be a lot of money. And that's true. It is a lot. It's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay if you really want to do something to let it stop you. And the worst possible thing that can happen to you is that you'll be out a few hundred dollars. And the nice thing about like kind of money and things like that is you can always go get more of it. 
So in the end, it's always the master has, you know, tried and failed you know, way more times than the person who's just starting has ever even thought about trying. So failure is okay. And that you should reframe failure from being bad to being like, I messed up. This was a learning experience. What am I going to learn from it? And therefore, what am I going to do better in the future? Yeah, you're exactly right. Like Einstein, like he had so many different experiments until he finally got the light bulb. What about you, Rachel? Like, could you give our audience some tips about how you do sourcing? Because that is a challenge for many new sellers. Yeah. So there are a few different ways to find items. You can look at sales to see, you know, we call them sale plans. What are some items that go on sale on like a rotational basis, specifically like Walgreens will do that. Other similar stores, Rite Aid, CBS. So stores like that. Um, so something that's profitable when it goes on sale and then you just, you hit that sale every time. It's nice because you get less competition than with regular replens and replens is just a name that we give us that you can buy over and over again. But as far as how to find those things, there's a couple ways you can simply bring up like the store, like walgreens.com. You can look at an ad, say, wow, that sounds like a good deal. Let me bring up amazon.com, see what the price is like. Okay, I can buy it for $5 and it's selling for $25. That's probably good. That's kind of like the really base level cheapest way to do it. And then once you're more comfortable with the whole setup, the whole process, and you are able to purchase some software, like Keepa is a huge one to get as early on as possible, then you can get some more data to kind of double check whether or not um, that is in fact a good buy. And then if you are a user of Inventory Lab, like most folks are, you can also get the phone app called Scoutify. Well, it's Scoutify 2. I don't think there is a Scoutify 1, but it's called Scoutify 2. They must have done some, some upgrade or something at some point. But Scoutify 2, you can actually scan barcodes or a lot of times people will suggest typing in the names of items if you're at the store, like the clearance aisle. You can walk down the clearance aisle, you can say, oh, wow, that Wi-Fi router from Walmart used to be $272. It's on clearance for $25. And then you scan it with the app. It'll tell you things like what the ranking is, which can give you clues on to whether or not or how quickly it would sell, how much it's selling for on Amazon, what your projected profit would be. So you can do stuff from your computer at home. You can go to the store and scan stuff. There's a million different ways that you can, can source items. Okay, not a million, but there's a lot. Is it possible for you to show us one, like uh, sure. right now? All right. So we've got a Walgreens ad, and I will do sometimes, or what I will have my, now I have a VA, he will go through and he will find some good sales going on in Walgreens. And when I first started selling, I was kind of selling everything. You know, I went from books to toys to kind of everything, and now I've kind of found the category I feel best in, and that's skincare and makeup. So, okay, so I might be interested in this sale. Buy two, get the third one free. That's a pretty commonly recurring sale at Walgreens. So not only is it a pretty good chance I'll find something, but there's also then a really good chance that that will come back on sale again later. So I'll probably, let's do the makeup though. Handy thing, just click shop now. It'll show you everything that is included in that sale. I have it set so that it will just look at things that are available for pickup. Because with Walgreens, one thing that I do myself and a friend who helps me out, not my VA, um, a separate person, he and I will place a bunch of pickup orders on Walgreens and then we'll both drive around and pick up the pickup orders. I don't do a lot of shipped orders from Walgreens to source from. The amount of times that something shows up damaged or missing, it's too much. <laughs> but this is what we'll do. So we'll go through, find a section of the ad we're interested in. And let's just say, maybe we want to see if we can find, let's see, what's a good brand. Let's look at Neutrogena. Let's look at Beauty. Okay. So these are some things that we could get. Let's see. I'm just going to start opening so up it's random ones, I guess. For the packaging, when you get it, not to be damaged. Like, yes. Uh, otherwise that would affect the price as well. Absolutely. Yeah. If things are damaged, um, or you might not even be able to sell it as new. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Right. Right. 
and then you're going to get those returns and those are a pain. Not only does that, you know, kind of, it increases your risk of negative feedback, but then you're also paying for removal fees afterwards once the item, if the item is returned to Amazon. Even more unfortunately, actually, within the beauty category, one thing that's kind of a negative associated with it is if something, if a customer even says um, this item is damaged, skincare and makeup is one of the sections where Amazon won't have them send the item back. But for me, I don't mind um, that being a negative because there's so many other pros within this category for me anyway. Everybody kind of lands in a different space. Okay, so let's look at, I personally don't like messing with things that have a lot of variations, at least if I'm sourcing this way. So I tend to avoid things like that, personal preference. Let's look at a couple of these though. This one looks like it would be pretty easy. Okay. And for the audience watching this, yeah, this is not super easy. It's doable, but it takes experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely takes practice and kind of figuring out what your comfort zone is. And one thing I'll point out too, if you find that you are comfortable doing something that a lot of other sellers aren't comfortable doing, see if you can capitalize on that. Like I don't mind selling hazmat products and I find a lot that I have reduced competition on that type of listing because most people don't want to deal with that. And just like, I don't like dealing with variations, but I know a handful of sellers who just do really well with those things. So if you can find something that you like that others don't, give that a shot. Okay, so let's see if we can find this item on Amazon and see how it's doing. So you could copy and paste the UPC here into Amazon to see what comes up. That works half of the time, maybe but sometimes there are multiple listings for the same product and it may be the one that's not linked to the UPC that's better. So let's get rid of a few things there, see what comes up. This looks like it, but that price is not great. So if we're gonna be buying this at about two thirds of that, then this is not gonna be profitable. But I did notice it goes out of stock sometimes. So this might be something worth revisiting later. So just for example, let's look at this old price. So if it's selling for $14.27 and this tool up here is called RevSeller, it's an extension. There are other very similar things. A lot of people use one called ASIN Insight. I think that's one that Cody uses, I believe. It basically is a Chrome extension that just auto-populates within Amazon on the item pages and it will tell you what your projected profit is based on different things that you've put in the settings. So like I estimated my ship to FBA cost as 30 cents a pound. It's usually less, but it's best to estimate high. Some other things, like if I wanted to have a default sales tax, I would put that in there too. So my buy cost for this would be 749, but two thirds of that. And what I like about these tools is you can do the math right on them. So with this item, it looks like I would make a profit of a dollar each. That doesn't meet my standards. I would not be buying this product. I wouldn't recommend it for any new person either. <laughs> not just because it goes in and out of stock for Amazon and you're probably not gonna be able to sell it at 1427, but if you're new and you have limited funds, you don't wanna sell something that's 8% ROI. You wanna aim for something a lot higher. So let's see if this other one is any better for us. And for the people just watching this, pieces. one of the important tips that Rachel said is like when you're starting out, you're looking for what kind of ROIs are you looking for when you're trying to find a product to source? So for me right now, my sweet spot is I'm trying to average 40% ROI. So I set that as my minimum, knowing I'm going to go below it quite often, but that I'll have some good ones that are higher. When I was limited on funds, and some people may think this sounds too high, but I was limiting myself to 80% minimum ROI while sourcing, knowing again that it would drop down quite a bit if there was competition and things like that. So I would say 70, 80% if you're super limited in funds. Or maybe, I mean, if you're doing books, you don't even need to set a limit, honestly, because they're all going to be so high anyway. Okay, so we've got a couple of things that come up here. This one's not profitable, but I don't think it's the right wrong color lid. I think that's the waterproof version and this is not waterproof, but this next one, let's see, brown, black, 
not waterproof. It looks like it is the match. Okay, so 949, but it's on that sale. So 949 times 0.67. So a profit of 11, 11 and a half bucks. Really good ROI. ka -ching. So this, yeah, this, this looks like a really, really good Are one. Are you looking it at the buy like, box price there? It looks like this one doesn't have a buy box. So Amazon okay. Okay. likely, Amazon likely thinks that this price is too high, but not so high that it's going to deactivate the whole thing. Um, and we can tell it's selling pretty good. And the number of sellers has spiked pretty recently, maybe because of this sale, but that actually hasn't made the price drop too bad. Let me zoom back out. So it's nice that with the fluctuating number of sellers too, it stayed really consistent. And look, I guess there was a buy box for a little bit. So I would say this is a really, really good item. And that's awesome. We, and we just yeah. found that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one other thing I would do too, when I find something like this, because this isn't like Walgreens specific brand. One thing I really like to do is if you get the image, if you're using Chrome, you can right click and search image with Google Lens. And you can actually find different stores that have a very similar image at them. So like I could, they sell it at Target. There it is. It's not the same buy cost, but with how profitable it is, this is still probably worth it. I don't know what this website is, but maybe that's a good website too. Uh, and my bet would be that like Walmart, yep, here it is Walmart, but that's funky. Don't do that. That's probably a third party seller. Plus it's the waterproof version. Yeah, so I, I really like using this image search tool too when I'm sourcing things like this. So, yeah, that's like yeah, an there you out go. of the box sourcing using Google yeah. Lens. And then, hey, why shouldn't you get paid to do shopping? Right? Like, if you like shopping, this, yes. is, this is the best <laughs> thing, right? Like, you're shopping every day, finding products, and then you're making money, you're profiting from them. Truly, I have found that I spend a lot less money on myself now because I kind of like get my fix buying for other people. It's been really good for me in a lot of ways. Thanks for sharing the sourcing yeah. demo in such great detail and just showing the audience how to do this. And then I got a question for Cody here. My understanding is you've done multi-packs. You've also done like packing them together. Like how does that work? Like multi-packs and bundling. Is this something that you've done in the past and you would suggest it for certain type of products? So yeah, I would say that I think that at the store, one of the things I was very guilty of when I was a new seller was not looking things up. There are a lot of products that you might find at the store, like you might find some, I don't know, some pumpkin bread. And if you just scan that UPC, if it's linked up properly, Amazon will direct you to just the pumpkin bread listing. So you'll only see that one pack of pumpkin bread. However, it's very possible that there's a two pack of that pumpkin bread being sold a three pack, a four pack, perhaps the pumpkin bread is bundled with some like gingerbread or maybe like a bread pan or something. And that if you take the little bit of extra time to just go ahead and search for pumpkin bread in your like Amazon seller app, or in if you're using something like Scoutify 2 or Scan Power, that you can go ahead and perhaps find some of these other bundles or multi-pack opportunities. And then it's simply just, well, I found the pumpkin bread. If I go find the, like the bread pan, you know, that's made by Anchor Hawking, when I add those two costs together, is it profitable to sell this? And I find that, that again, that doing a little bit of extra work that not a lot of people necessarily want to do, that you get to reap a lot more opportunity. And then usually because you combine two things, the price, the selling price on it is going to be a bit more. And with kind of how Amazon like pick and pack fees and stuff works, usually you'll be able to make a little bit more, you know, overall like margin on the product as opposed to just selling it one at a time. A follow-up question is, when does it make sense to create a completely new listing, like a new ASIN on Amazon for a bundle or for a multi-pack? Sure, so two thoughts on that. One is just, I'd say, if you are an extremely new seller, my strong opinion is to do not mess with new listings. Listings, there's lots of things that you can do wrong. And there's literally like tens of millions of products on Amazon. And that kind of with that, it's moderately likely that you, you don't have the experience to necessarily know or how to create the listing. So you're going to be sinking a lot of time into trying to make something exist. And then it likely, you know, isn't going to work out well. 
Now, however, if you do have some selling experience and you do want to give it a go, especially with the holidays coming up, just, I don't know, think of things that are very giftable. Like maybe you want to make some pumpkin cookies with some gingerbread cookies with some buttercream cookies. So therefore you see that, oh, Betty Crocker sells all of those. So you take each one of their uh, cookie mixes and you make a bundle, you know, of it together. You know, I would generally find that when it comes to food, like food and beauty products, that if you're just a rational human being about what you're looking at, and if if you have gone to the store and you've bought it together, or if for a little bit of a cheat sheet, if you scroll down and look on an Amazon product page, you can see a frequently bought together section. If you look in that section, there's going to be lots of ideas and little suggestions for, you know, what you could bundle together to help bring value to the customer and then also make a little bit more money. You know, the the goal with creating a listing at all, it's really, you want to take yourself necessarily out of, you're just here to make money, but it's ultimately like, how am I helping the consumer? How does this help and make their life easier? And if you put yourself in the consumer, like first mindset, then likely when you do make listings, you're going to make some really good stuff. that's actually going to bring value and therefore get sales and make you money. Thanks for that input, Cody. That makes a lot of sense when the products together can sell for more expensive. And here's another question from an eBay seller is on eBay, like when we make a listing, we would take pictures, we try to make it as nice as possible. And then maybe my listing can get a little bit higher price than somebody else's. But on Amazon, you know, there's the ASINs, all the pictures are already there. How do I make my product more expensive. And then, you know, I'm not talking about private label here. I'm talking about, you know, strictly for arbitrage sourcing and arbitrage Amazon sellers, or is there a way? Well, basically kind of what we already touched on, like being able to have multi-packs, being able to have bundles of the item, again, bringing value to kind of the consumer, having a very good product images like Amazon product photo studio within the Amazon seller app. Honestly, with a good background, does a pretty good job of helping you make the Amazon compliant photos and and take pretty decent photos. But pretty much if you are going to attempt to make a listing and you do want it to do well, I mean, basically the customer is ultimately going to decide if the value proposition that you're proposing is fair. You know, if they don't want to buy three gingerbread cookie mixes for $70, well, then your price is probably bad. Hopefully you didn't buy those three for 50 bucks. But, you know, if you ever do an interesting thing you bring up, which again, if you are a new seller, just please don't do this. It'll it'll be a lot of work. But for a more experienced seller, if you ever run across a listing where the product photo isn't very good, or when you look at the product title, it's not very clear what's happening and there's no bullet points or no description. If you can go ahead and edit listings like that and actually fix them up, you can take products that are maybe only selling several times a year and turn them into products that are selling several times a month or several times a week. And because you help to make this product more visible and then to the search engine and then overall more visible and appealing to the customer so they, that they want to buy. Thanks, Cody. And Rachel, I want to ask you uh, for beauty products, is there anything else to watch out for other than, you know, the packaging you want to make sure, and also those ROIs that you mentioned earlier, is there anything else that you should watch out for when selling beauty products? So I'd say the other couple of things that I run into are expiration dates. Definitely be cautious with that if you're going to jump into the world of cosmetics and skincare. And that's similar with grocery too. But with cosmetics, it's a little bit different because they don't always have a very clear expiration date posted on them. They probably do a third of the time. The rest of the time, they're going to have a lot number that you can typically check online. There's a couple of databases. Cody, do you know what the name of that is off the top of your head? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, I forget what it is. But if you just Google like check lot number expiration date, there will be a couple different things that come up where you can actually enter the lot number and the brand and it will tell you what the production date is, what the expiration date is. So that's definitely another thing to watch out for. Uh, Yeah, I I think that's all I've got in addition to the the other thing. Well, there's also, if you're going to go with higher level skincare fancier stuff, watch out for Amazon to gate things suddenly. I recently had a traumatic experience (laughs) with with a brand that Amazon suddenly said nobody else can sell except for them. So be cautious with how 
deep you go. I don't recommend going out and dropping $1,000 on a single brand unless it's a hit that you could absorb or unless you're willing to create a whole bunch of eBay listings to try to save some of that money. So definitely be careful with that. And there's a higher percentage of brands that issue IP complaints too. So just do a little bit of research on the brands first. So talk a little bit about the expiration date. Bequal has a conditional repricing that has the inventory age. Could you tell us a little bit more? When did you decide it was time to use a repricer? Okay, so I started using a repricer when I was probably six or seven months in. Initially, I tried using, there is a nice one that I think is really good when you're starting out. I think it starts is like new price or something like that. I really liked it a lot. Let me, I want to look up the name because I, I wouldn't use them now because it is like pseudo manual repricing. I really liked them when I started though, because it was manual pricing, but through their interface and they give you the data and you manually make the changes. So as like a small new seller, it was awesome. But then once I got up past like a hundred listings, it wasn't doable anymore. So then that's when I started using some different repricers. And I recently changed to be cool. I was it three or four months ago or something. Cause I found with my previous repricer that I liked, I didn't have a lot of big issues with my last repricer at all, but I found that I was going in a lot to change what strategy was being applied to my different listings because of things like expiration dates and making sure that my inventory wasn't sitting for too long. And then when I heard that Be Cool had the conditional repricing, in addition to AI, which I hadn't utilized before at all either, I decided to give it a shot. And I've loved being able to go in and say, once it's it there for 30 days, I want the strategy to change. I want my minimum ROI to change instead of me having to go in a couple times a week and filtering through everything and making those changes it has saved me so much time. And then I don't have to worry as much about those products sitting there for too long and potentially expiring. Has it helped you increase your sales? I believe it has just from just looking at the charts. I haven't dug into the data specifically, but it seems that way. Yes. Do you know how much? Um, I don't. But I shared within Insider's Growth Group, I did share a screenshot of my sales growth at one point because the difference was pretty cool, both when I started and then also when I decided that I wanted my default rule to be AI equalizer instead of like profit booster. I really like that equalizer setting. So kind of fine tuning all that also gave me a really big boost in sales. Was it easy to set up? Yeah. When I first logged in, it didn't look like it would be easy to set up, but it ultimately was. I gave it a shot. And once I kind of got familiar with just like the different color and the different way things were laid out, my biggest issue was just that it was a change. Um, but once I got used to it, it was very, very easy to set up. The AI strategies or rules are just, they're ready to go. I went in and I did make a couple adjustments, but I mean, they're great as is. You don't have to spend time adjusting those if you don't want to. And then I made my conditional repricing. That took more time to change or to set it up, you know, to tell it when it would change from different strategy to different strategy. But it took a lot less time than I was committing every week prior to that. So yeah, it was pretty easy. So Cody, do you have any questions about our repricer? Well, I guess I know we talked about it a little bit before off camera, so I guess we'll we'll circle back to those. Could you tell me more about the kind of what you think makes Be Cool unique within the repricing space? And then especially, you know, focus on the different types of like AI, you know, strategies that you guys have and how they can help, you know, sellers maximize their sales. I think for the AI rules, we have five different AI rules going from least aggressive to most aggressive based on sales or also your profits. And other than AI, we also have conditional repricing. And all of this starts at $50. It's an affordable price point. And on top of that, we're in the MWS Development Council uh, with our 10 years of experience. We continue to launch new updates and we are continuing to do that over and over year after year. So we're excited. If you are from another repricer, you're definitely welcome to try us out. And we have a 14-day free trial, which you don't need your credit card yeah, just to try out. And then you can see the results as well. But anyway, it's not about the Be Cool repricer. It's about you guys. So I'm going to ask you some more questions here to continue on here. And this is for Cody. So Cody, you said you're a workaholic. 
how many hours do you put into your business, into your Amazon business every week? And what about now? <laughs> when you first started? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So at the beginning, when, especially when you're in the learning stage, whether you're putting in, whether you're able to just give, you know, 20 hours over the span of a week, cause you got, you know, a job and, you know, kids to contend with, or whether you're putting in, you know, 80 hours a week, it's a lot. At the beginning, I would say I was probably putting in during like this, even the summer, like probably like 20 hours a week. And then once we ramped up into closer to the fourth quarter, like we are now, it was basically, it was all I was doing, eat, sleep, you know, Amazon, that's, that's it. But especially during the fourth quarter, that type of, you know, strategy can have some really big dividends as a lot of the sales you know, are concentrated within the months of October, November, and December. You know, for our business and product mix personally, we can almost sell the execs, do the exact same amount in sales in October, November, December that we do the other nine months of the year. But it's taken quite a bit to get to that point. You know, there are certain days during the fourth quarter where when I know certain things are happening where I won't sleep. And so I'll be awake for like 30 hours. And I know that that's not a thing a lot of people can do. So, so don't try to push yourself to that, but just know that there's a lot of opportunity. So whatever you can do is great. And that again, it's all your own journey that even if you're able to do a little bit, like action is awesome. And that you can kind of make this, you know, something like this, whatever you want it to be, whether you want it to just be a little side hustle or whether you, you know, want to grow it into a business the, the opportunities are there. It's just really about putting in the work and, and learning. Thanks, Cody, for that. And what about you, Rachel? How many hours do you put in your Amazon business every week at the beginning? And what about now? Well, at the beginning, it's a little interesting for me because I, I live kind of in the middle of the woods. I live in a really small town and there isn't much around me for sourcing. So I used it as an excuse to go on trips. So it was more like I would spend every weekend out on the road buying things. And then I'd, I'd come back and I would spend, I mean, at the beginning, it was like just a few tubs of books each time. So I would probably spend, you know, four hours prepping a small shipment and then doing things like the manual repricing at the beginning, a couple hours and other management stuff, like a couple hours per week. But it was, yeah, weekends and then a few more hours at first. And then as I switched into RA, it was probably, it was more than that, but not by a ton. And then when I went really full-time, it's probably like 40, 50 hours a week when I started really going hard and doing not just trips for sourcing, but also sourcing online. So once I kind of opened up that door to now I can spend as much time as possible working as a former teacher, I'm trained to expand and, and fill all the possible time working. So I'm kind of similar to, to Cody in that way. And I'm trying to step back. So maybe I should <laughs> take a day off every week too, like Cody said. So and, and I would say now it's still very similar. I still work almost every hour, but I'm able to fill those work hours with different things like the um, Insiders Growth Group community, the Q4 stuff, some like house upgrades. So I still work that much, but as far as just Amazon, I probably now do like 15, 20 hours a week. And Rachel, what's your future plan for your Amazon business? So right now, the thing I'm enjoying most, actually, I've started to kind of dive into wholesale. So I would like to ultimately do just wholesale beauty. That's kind of kind of my hopes, but I, it kind of changes every five or six months. So we'll see. So I guess that's my plan is to just kind of keep seeing what I enjoy and keep doing whatever that is. And what about you, Cody? Yeah, so I have several things. So I guess sort of to kind of address a little add on to the last question is, yeah, right now, my role within my organization now at the beginning, I was a, you know, sole operator wearing every single hat. You know, now I employ, I don't know, in the neighborhood of 10 people or so that either help um, manage the warehouse, help do purchasing, and then, you know, a few virtual assistants that manage things like account health, repricing, things of that nature. So my job you know, several years later has become much more of a, an overseer. And my goal is to like drive the direction of the business and then help to kind of move us forward with different tools and optimizations and things of that nature. Now, as far as kind of where my goals within Amazon lies, I really, 
enjoy where my current like RAOA operation is at. So it's pretty much just to maintain that and that my goals are simply just to grow the, um, the food brands that we have established on Amazon and to really grow our um, contract manufacturing, co-packing, and then prep center, third-party logistics leg of our business. Yeah, thanks for that detailed answer. And just to follow up with you, from your experience, you've been in the business since you know more than 10 years, longer than that. What parts of the job can you outsource and which part should you do yourself? And of course, at you know, different times, of course, at different milestones. But what's your advice, Cody? Yeah, so that's a really good point that you'd say that like different milestones, because that's extremely true. You know, when you're starting out, I super, I'm of the opinion that when you're starting out, you should really, you should do your own prep. You should understand how that process works. Because if you say want to hire a prep center, how will you truly be able to understand that the prep center is, you know, fully doing a good job if you yourself have never actually prepped your stuff and it makes being able to relate to certain issues and obstacles that the prep center, you know, might run into that you, because you've never prepped yourself, you don't know what that's like. They're really, the sky is kind of the limit is what is outsourceable. I would say for many people, the first big things that they, you know, outsource are they get people to help them prep. And if they're looking to get a virtual assistant that they typically want to have that virtual assistant help them source. And so I'd say that's whatever they kind of want to tackle here. So if you have, are looking for a VA and you want to have them source, it's, you can't lead someone to a place you've never been. And so be mindful of if you would admit yourself that you are not a very good sourcer, then how will you know if the leads that this VA is presenting you with are actually good and quality leads? But also, if you have developed some skill where you feel like sourcing is good, then my advice when it comes to getting help from either a VA or even someone that's domestic to you when it comes to something like sourcing is that you don't have to give away the whole process to someone to have them help you. So a very good example I like to use is within the tool tactical arbitrage, which can be a very helpful tool for sourcing, is that if you're just scanning a store like Walmart, most of us sellers know that depending on how you have your settings set up, the vast majority of things that it's going to present you with as results, they are either not exact matches or they're not gonna be profitable. And it's going to be very obvious that they're not profitable. Well, rather than you trying to have a VA come in and do the whole kit and caboodle as far as running TA and then making all your purchasing decisions for you right away, why not just start out by having the VA come in where you run them a bunch of scans and then you just show them, hey, this is how you determine if something matches. Like if the product on Walmart matches the product on Amazon, this is how you determine it's profitable or like it's very unprofitable. And then just work your way to more complexity over time because the vast majority of what you're going to be looking at in something like TA is very easy to spot that it's bad. But if you can remove all that riffraff, then you're going to make your life as someone that is very experienced with sourcing way easier. So you're going to really improve your, basically your sourcing dollars per hour for your own productivity. And that's, I'd say, a really big thing is I think a lot of people when they're outsourcing is they want to outsource the whole task. And yet the reality is you don't have to do that right away. You can just start outsourcing little pieces of the tasks that are very inconvenient for you and time consuming and work your way up to having someone completely take it over for you. That's a really good tip, Cody. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Let's see. Do you mind directing that at Rachel first? I'm sure I'll have something. <laughs> okay, sure. No worries. Yeah. So Rachel, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience before we end today? Well, first of all, thank you for making my cat, Sam, feel very welcome. <laughs> he made that appearance a little bit ago. So he's an attention hog. So as far as like last things to throw out there, well, to add to that outsourcing thing, it's something that I'm working on too. I'm probably 50% like automated and like outsourced. I agree with Cody on the prep help and that can go one of two ways. It could be like an in-house helper. You know, some people have their kids help. Some people hire folks from their neighborhood, things like that. Or you could get a prep center. Like Cody actually runs a prep center. Feel free to cut that out if Cody says he doesn't want that publicized. But so you could get a prep center where you have things shipped to them from, you know, different OA purchases that you make. Or if you're lucky enough to have a prep center near your house, some of them actually will allow you to drop things off if you're doing some RA or pickups or things like that. 
But like he said, you know, almost everything, there is a way that you can remove bits and pieces to make things easier for you. Thank you for those tips for sourcing. And here's another follow-up question for the prep and pack service. So my understanding is prep and pack service costs about $2, $2.50. When does it make sense for you to start using a prep and pack center? Yeah, good point. So prep centers will vary by cost. So if someone were to just look up a whole bunch of prep centers right now, you'd probably find costs that seem to vary from like 80 cents to like 250. My suggestion first for picking a prep center, if you've already decided you want one, don't automatically jump to the cheapest one and don't gravitate towards the most expensive one because they're probably, you know, not the only great one out there. But with the cheapest ones, you're going to find a couple of things you're going to find either that they have to price that low, potentially, again, look into it, but they maybe they have to price that low because they've struggled. Definitely look up some reviews, or you're going to find that that's not really the true cost, which isn't always bad, but a lot of times there will be add-ons. So it'll be 80 cents, but then it'll be an extra 25 every time there's a poly bag, an extra 50 every time they have to bubble wrap. So just be cautious and look into that pricing structure. As far as when to start using a prep center, I wouldn't base that on anything financial. I would work your financial choices around that. And I would suggest looking at prep centers once prepping yourself takes up so much time that you could be outsourcing. You could be doing these other things that are actually income producing activities. And then once you do that, you may find that since you need to consider an extra $2 into your costs, that maybe a third of the items you were looking at before are no longer worth it because you're paying that extra cost. But ultimately, that will be worth it. So maybe now you don't say, I need my items to be at least $2 profit. Maybe now you only look at things that are 4 or $5 profit. And that's those are the exact numbers that ended up being my, for me, being the example for me. So that's how I would do it. If it's taking up so much of your time that you're limiting how much money you're making, that's when you need to change. That's a really good perspective. Like not just looking at the financial side, but also your time, you know, the opportunity costs, time that you can do other stuff as well. And for all our audience today, you could hear these are experts sharing, seven-figure sellers sharing real strategies to really help you improve and grow your business to that next level. So this question's for Cody. You guys operate an insider growth group, and you guys have a large panel of Amazon experts, over 45 of them. And if you were to listen to each of these or take your course, it'll be thousands, a thousand, tens of thousands. And if you can just get one idea that can really just streamline your business, you know, that can really get you to that next level. That can might move you from you know, five figure to six figure, maybe from six to seven, and even listening to mid eight figure sellers. Cody, is there any special promotion for the insider Q4 extravaganza group? Um, yeah. So basically to anyone that's listening to this, we're going to be offering a $75 off a coupon. If they go ahead and subscribe. The code is just 75OFF, no spaces, just 75 off. By the time that this video is seen, our regular registration date will probably have passed. Our general registration ends September 30th. So we will be extending the deadline. If you're going to use that code, it will let you register late. So be sure to use that for that discount and to get in. So oh, that's terrific. So definitely check it out in the description below. Find that Facebook Insider Growth Group. Definitely join and get all of this value that you'll get. And on top of that, you get $75 off, which is a great saving. And then you could use that for your repricer, right? <laughs> so, uh, but we do recommend maybe have 50 to 100 listings before you use a repricer. Yeah, so thanks a lot for your time today, Cody and Rachel. Uh, super informative, insightful, and thanks for sharing your Amazon story and journey with our audience. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for awesome. having us. Thanks for having us.